In this video, I will share with you a super nice puzzle, but before getting into it, I want to say, whilst the result which follows from the problem is definitely important and interesting, I want to highlight how different observations made in the early stages of the problem solving process will lead to different and yet equally beautiful proofs. Although on the surface, it may seem like these two proofs were found artificially, just to illustrate this point, the premise of this video is actually based anecdotally on the two approaches me and a friend of mine used to solve this problem, my friend being the person who suggested this problem to me. The puzzle we are addressing is, suppose there are an odd number of criminals in a room such that the distance between any pair of criminals is distinct. In other words, no two pairs of criminals have the same distance from each other. Every criminal watches the criminal closest to them. Prove that there is always at least one criminal who is unwatched by any other criminal. Before we get into solving, I want to iterate that I encourage you to try this problem yourself and pause at the key breaks in chapters to complete the proofs independently. To get a better feel for the problem, it makes sense to look at small cases with a small number of criminals. But before that, we need a better way to represent this problem. Observe that we can represent the criminals with dots, which are referred to as vertices or nodes, and if a criminal is watched by another criminal, then I will place an edge between these two, in particular a directed edge. Together, these form a directed graph, and if we have n criminals, then we must have n vertices and n edges. Now, looking back at the problem, the first question you might have is, how is oddness important? If you think about it for a bit, you may realise with an even number of criminals, we can pair them up in such a way that each pair look at each other, a sort of staring contest, so no criminal is left unwatched. With that out of the way, we should start looking at some small, odd cases. When there is one criminal, obviously this criminal is unwatched. When we have three criminals, you might notice something. Observe that the pair of criminals, whose distance is minimal over all three pairs, are both watching each other. This leaves the third criminal unwatched. This idea of considering the pair of criminals whose distance is minimal was the key to the proof that I used. However, as we go up to five criminals, and then seven criminals, and then nine criminals, you might spot another pattern. There doesn't appear to be any sort of closed loops of directed edges, known as cycles, longer than two criminals. And this is something that we may conjecture. More simply put, the only cycle that seems to form is a sort of staring contest between two criminals. This was the conjecture that my friend used in his proof, but before we go to see exactly how my friend proved this conjecture, I want to return to my observation about their minimal length. My crucial idea was to see what happens if we remove these specific two criminals from the room whose distance is minimal. For convenience, label these two criminals as A and B, and suppose that there were 2n plus 1 criminals in total. We know if there is some unwatched criminal, say x, then x is neither A nor B, since A and B both watch each other. Hence, by removing A and B, we're left with 2n minus 1 criminals which should hopefully still contain x. This sort of recursive logic 
where the truth of the previous case implies truth of the next case should scream one thing, induction. I will formalize this induction argument shortly, but the conjecture that we'd made about the length of the longest cycle seems like something we should try and prove. Assume for a contradiction that there exists some cycle of length k greater than 2 criminals, which we can label a1, a2, all the way up to ak, where a1 watches a2, a2 watches a3, and so on until it cycles back to ak watches a1. Now, the key is that a criminal watches another criminal if and only if there is no other criminal closer by. We can use this to form some inequalities. A1 watches A2, so AK is further from A1 than A2. Hence, A1 A2 is less than AK A1. But AK watches A1, so AK A1 is less than AK minus 1 AK. We can keep repeating this around the entire cycle going backwards to obtain the following inequality. But look at the two ends of our inequality. We're saying that a1a2 is less than a1a2, which is nonsense and is exactly the contradiction we were looking for. After seeing this, it starts to seem clear why oddness was important to the question. We can suppose that there are m pairs of criminal who are in such a staring contest with a cycle of length 2, and then all the other criminals must be in some path on the graph. However, any criminal which is at the start of a path in the graph is unwatched, since there exists no edge going into that vertex and since the number of criminals was odd, at least one such criminal must exist, since we can't pair all of these criminals together, which completes the proof that my friend used. For completeness of this video, let's go back and formalize our inductive proof. We already established when there is one criminal, trivially, this criminal must be unwatched, and this acts as our base case. Now, Assume for some k that with 2k minus 1 criminals, there exists some unwatched criminal x. Then, for the next case in our inductive step with 2k plus 1 criminals, we choose criminals a and b such that their distance is minimal over all possible pairs of criminals and remove these from the room. This leaves us with 2k minus 1 criminals but we have to be careful and note that some of our criminals who were originally watching A or B are now watching some different criminal. By our assumption, in this new room, there must be some unwatched criminal X. But when we go back and reintroduce A and B back into the room, some of these criminals might convert to watching A or B, but since the length of AB was minimal, then neither A or B would convert to watching X, so this criminal X remains unwatched, as required to complete the proof. To conclude, I think both methods, despite coming from very different observations, both provide their own merit. Generally, direct proofs help understand why a particular result is true, and induction has a reputation for skimping over the real understanding of why the conclusion is what it is, because the assumption jumps over any deeper understanding of the problem. While to a certain extent this might also apply to this problem, the induction does still do a good explanation as to why an unwatched soldier must exist, even if not as explicit as a direct proof. The purpose of this video isn't to say that one approach was better than the other, I'd argue they're just as elegant, but to highlight the nuances which led to these different lines of thoughts 
and then these different proofs.